Good? Okay. There we go. Um, so I just flew in and I raced here, so I have no idea about what's been said before me. I caught a little bit of the last one here, but um, I am happy to be here. I'm happy to be in Vegas because I, we're in Chicago. We've got this like extended winter going on, so being here is fantastic. It was beautiful walking here from across the street, but what, what I wanted to share with you out of the gates here is the story that happened to me right before I left. We've got about 30 minutes to have fun up here. In fact, it didn't even start yet, so we're good to go here. But right before I left, I was in the office. I was trying to close things down. I wanted to uh, at least get half the stuff off my plate before I came here and let it piled up. And there was this box that got delivered to my office, about yay big. And it didn't have a return address on it. And so I opened it, of course, and inside of it was this really cool, like, antique lamp. And... I did what everybody would have done. I looked around and then I, I rubbed it and this genie came out and the genie says to me, okay, you're, you're getting three wishes. I'm like, this is awesome. Unfortunately, I look behind me and two of my senior VPs are standing behind me like, dude, come on, man. And I'm like, okay, fine. We'll each get one. So my first guy, Russ, he goes, and he says, all right, I want to wake up every day. I want to live in a castle in the Bahamas, wake up every day, get picked up on a boat, go trophy fishing every day, and cut back and chill. Poof, he's gone. Second guy, Alex, he says, well, I want to wake up in Hawaii every day. I want to go surfing. I want to come back, have a massage on the beach, and I want to have unlimited boat drinks every single day. Poof, he's gone. Jeannie turns to me, and he's like, what about you? I said, well, I got a lot to do, so I'm going to need both of those guys back after lunch. <laughs> now, what's the moral of this story? Um, well, is it always let your boss go first, especially when there's a genie involved? Maybe. Um, what does any of that have to do with this? Probably nothing at the end of the day, unless we want to, like, strap on our big brains and really dissect and dive into that story from a cultural perspective. We might look at that and say, you know, Maybe I had a uh, maybe I had a culture like a top-down culture. Maybe I had a very hierarchical culture in that perspective, telling everybody where they need to be and what to do. Uh, maybe it's even tyrannical uh, at the end of the day. But if we were to do that, okay, we would be wrong, in my opinion. We would be dead wrong on that, okay. Um, and I think that's where the world has gotten off track when it comes to really cultures inside of organizations out there, is we start to describe them. We just describe them. Um, but in reality, there's only two types of cultures that exist. Two. There's only two. There's an intentional culture and there's an unintentional culture, period. There's only two types, intentional and unintentional, or what I call accidental. Everything else is a description or a target or a goal. Everything else. But it starts here. I was working with a woman recently who runs a very large RIA in Mississippi. She is uh, very successful on paper. She's miserable in practice because she can't keep people. She's got this revolving door. And I started working with her. And I asked her in this little strategy session. I was like, so uh, what's this culture about? Like, what's your deal? What's going on? And she said, oh, we have a culture of accountability. And I'm like, really, tell me more about that. And she did. But as we started to go through things and uncover and kind of peel back the onion in her organization, you know what we found? She had an unintentional culture and a target of accountability. But when we have an unintentional culture and a target of accountability, how many times are we going to hit that target when we're unintentional? Never. She was way over here, way over here in right field. So she was never hitting it, thus her problems. So what happens? What's beyond this? Well, it starts to create a major problem. Right now, we have this problem out there in the global workforce is that engagement is at 15%. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means 85% of the time, people are out there hanging out on uh, Facebook, maybe planning their weekend, not engaged in the work that they're doing, not inspired by the work that they're doing, and not delivering on the work that's expected. It's a major gap. What a major opportunity if we can A, understand it, B, be aware of it, and C, have a method to be able to repair it, to fix it, to get it on, on pace. There's a lot to capture in that number of 15%. But it's not moving. It hasn't moved. Not a whole lot. 
when you have a defined and intentional business, or intentional culture in your business, you're gonna be on track, but when you don't, this is foundational problems. When you don't, it's like building a house on a foundation of styrofoam. And I work with businesses and companies and leaders all the time and I watch their spend. And they spend tons of money on walls and on the best roofs and the best technology inside of the place. And you fail to look underneath the ground and the foundation is built out of styrofoam. There is no intentional culture in place and things start to fall off. Things don't work. Implementation falls off with all the other stuff that they're trying to do because they don't have the sound foundation underneath to hold it up. So it becomes a major problem, but yet also a major opportunity out there in the world. Here's another one. You'll never have the power to pick which experiences make up the organizational culture. It will forever be an average of them all. What does that mean? Well, I find out there with leaders, more than not, is this check the box syndrome that happens around organizational culture around the experiences that people are having. Like, I will ask questions. Hey, tell me about your culture. Oh, oh, Cortine, we, uh, we do a culture thing once a quarter. I'm like, okay. Or I hear, uh, we like to do something for culture once a month. And my favorite, true story, I heard it not that long ago, we take care of culture every Friday. We do this thing called Breakfast Friday. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then they started, I'm like, no, I got it. I understand Breakfast Friday. But at the end of the day, what the real question I was asking was, what happens in between? So you're telling me that in between, let's go with the, let's go with the stretch. On the quarters, if you're taking care of culture once a quarter, in between those three months, there is absolutely no interaction, no communication, you're not talking to people, seeing you're not helping anybody, there's nothing, no deliverables happening inside of that organization. Like, oh no, we work in the same office, we see each other all the time. I'm like, okay, so we're missing the boat here yet again because culture happens every, everything. It's not a light switch, you don't get to turn it on and pick what is, this is, but this isn't. It's the average of everything that creates the temperature inside of the organization. So it's a very critical component here, very critical. So if you're starting to understand or think differently about this, you might ask yourself, well, where do you start? Where do you, where do you start to fix this? Where do you start to kind of put this thing back on track? This is where it started for me. Now, be honest. Is anybody else in here besides me totally addicted to buying stuff on Amazon? You're in a safe room. Okay. What's your name? Sandy. Sandy? Okay. So Sandy and I, we come home every day and we're absolutely pissed off if there's not something outside of that door because we're excited and we like to open, it's like gifts that keep showing up and we don't remember paying for it. So we get upset when that happens, but I don't, Sandy probably hang with me on this one, okay? Because this all came together for me on a specific type of Amazon day, what I call the big days. The big days are kind of like this, or actually maybe possibly bigger. Big days are when Sandy, turns on her street and she can already see in front of her house this big brown box pyramid and it's exciting and she floors it to get there because oh my goodness. And this all changed for me on one of these big days. And here's what happened. I was in my house and I was coming around through my entryway and there's my wife on the ground gasping for air as she's trying to swim to safety because she got caught up in a brown box avalanche. You cannot open the front door aggressively in my house. You can't, because you don't know. You've got to peek around or go outside and look at it first. But she whip, whipped it open and boom, and I, I figured I had something to do with it, so I threw my arm out and I drug her to safety. I got her to the stairs. And as she caught her breath, she looked at me calmly, and she looked down at the sea of boxes and she said, you know what, do we really need all this stuff? And now my initial guy response to this was like, well, hell yeah, we need all this. But I was terrified. I didn't say that. I was terrified of her follow-up question because what if she said, well, what's in those boxes? Because I don't know about you, Sandy, but I have no idea when they show up. It's exciting. I don't remember buying it. I don't know what's in there. And so I was terrified of that question. So as she waited patiently, staring at me, I said, um, it's the best I could come up with. I said, well, some of it falls into the need category, but most of it falls into the want category. And I tried to sound smart and I failed. And she just very calmly turned around and walked away. But not in the normal way, in the way that she knew that I knew that she knew that I was absolutely insane. 
But this started to settle into my brain as I look now at this sea of boxes and I asked myself, why do I want all this stuff? And I figure, well, let's find out. So I jump in like a kid on Christmas morning and I start ripping through. And the first thing that I unveil, the first thing I pull out of is a fishing rod. And I'm looking at this fishing rod. Now, granted, this is not my first fishing rod. In fact, I have many other fishing rods that would deem this purchase not in the need category, but in the want category. So I stared at this fishing rod even further, and I asked myself, why did I want this particular fishing rod? And then I remembered. I remembered the advertisement. I remember that this particular fishing rod had the most, the most sensitive and strongest carbon fiber technology ever invented in the history of the world. And because of that, I would never lose a fish again. And because of that, I would land an absolute monster. And because of that, I would my buddies in the boat would have to stop what they're doing and take a picture as I'm hoisting this thing up. I would reach fishing boats, hero status. Because of that, I could chill in the back of the boat with the Yeti full of Coors Light. Wow, like what, what an experience, what a memory, what a day, what an experience. And then it hit me. It hit me right then. I wanted that fishing rod for the intended experience that it was going to deliver for me. And somebody out there understood this and understood that there are people like me in the world, people like me out there that are going to be motivated when I see this fishing rod, motivated enough to hit that orange proceed with order Amazon button, like I did. And then I thought about it deeper. Well, how do they do this? How do they make this happen? I mean, you can't just take a bunch of parts and slap them together willy-nilly and expect it to work. No, there's a... There's a schematic, there's a blueprint behind this, there's assembly lines and a pattern of how this comes together based on how you, the unique, how they weave the carbon fiber to create maximum strength without losing sensitivity to the unique way the reels, but all these things to create this product with the intention of furthering this experience to me or people like me. And then it hit me. It hit me right then. It hit me like a brow box avalanche. Company culture is no different. Company is no, culture is no different than that fishing rod story that I just told you. That these experiences, there's a targeted experience, and there's widgets coming off of an assembly line inside of organizations around that target with a schematic behind it and consistency behind it to be able to deliver on it day in and day out, to pull that average up. And because of this, I came up with this, this profit culture formula. A very, it's, it's the easiest and most simple way to systematize culture, to bring it to that assembly line manufacturing model out in the world. Step one, we talked about it. Establish a baseline and bullseye. We need a target, okay? Start at the beginning, but with the end in mind. But we need a target, and it can't be arbitrary. You know what I hear when I, when I talk to uh, organizations and leaders about company culture? 99% of the time, I get the glue gun, band-aid answer. Tell me about your culture. Oh, we are one big family here. I hear it all the time. And it actually bothers me now, because then I got to ask my follow-up questions, like, which family? Which family? Like the family that wakes up every day, hugs each other, says I love you, and opens presents all day, that family? Or the other family that steals from each other, stabs each other in the back, and screams at each other all day long? Because both types of those families exist. There are families that I know I won't go anywhere near. But they're still families. So we need to go deep in our target and deep in our bullseye and deep into the granular detail so we know exactly, exactly what we're trying to bring out there and what we're trying to push across the table to the end user. And when we get that, Second step, the red velvet rope rule, critical, all right? So imagine this, this is great when I do this talk in Vegas because it's perfect. Imagine this, I invite you to a, to a uh, invitation only, exclusive party down at the hottest club down the strip here, all right? And you show up later tonight, dressed to the nines, and you roll up, and you're, you're surprised to see that there's a gentleman in a top hat. And in front of him is a red velvet rope strung between two brass poles. 
And you walk up, he asks you your name, you tell him, looks at his list, he flashes you a smile, drops one under the rope, and lets you into the party. Right then, when you step over that rope, right then, how do you feel? How do you feel right then? I'll tell you how you feel right then. You feel like a rock star. Because that's how you feel when you get in knowing that other people don't. And that's why the second step, stage two here, is critically important in organizations to be able to understand the types of people, the people that are going to press, proceed with order on that fishing rod, the types of people that are going to link to that bullseye and baseline and start to hire those folks only and be selective with that. Critical. And once we know what we're doing and who it's appropriate for, next up is time to build the machine and turn it on. This is where we get extremely systematic with it. This is where we start to measure and we want to capture all of the experiences that are happening. This is where we look at each individual experience and ask ourselves a very simple question. Is it in alignment with stage one? If it's not, we need to correct it. If we can't correct it, we need to kill it, get rid of it, it's gone, get it out of here. And when we bring attention to this, it's crazy. I still, I've been using this in businesses of mine for 15 years. It is still, I'm still finding things that without a system in place, I would have overlooked. And it's pulling off of the line. It's pulling off of the target. But it puts us in the right context to be able to judge all of these things. And you know what? It's the little things. It's the small things. It's what might be considered a minute detail. But the little things are the big things. And unfortunately, they are most often overlooked in our organizations out there. This brings a magnifying glass to the whole thing and asks some very simple questions around it. Stage four, when we get there, we wanna make sure, okay, that what's coming off of the assembly line is staying, uh, is staying tied to stage one. This is quality, quality control. Every manufacturing organization out there has quality control. We have to make sure the widgets coming off are in alignment with the expectation of the folks that are supposed to buy it in the red velvet rope rule. We have to make sure. So we have to keep continuing to look at the gaps that are existing in there and moving this. And the other side of it is that this is not a one and done. We don't set culture in an organization reap the benefits of it and stand still because if we reap the benefits, if we start to capture dollar for dollar more of that 85% that's going out the door in engagement, if we start to capture that in organizations, guess what's going to happen? It's going to work. It's going to grow. We're going to grow. Then what? Culture's going to evolve. Is that a bad thing? No. It's a necessary thing. It's a necessary thing. Cultures, in, in, I have a company, and one of, the, one of our companies, the culture that I started with, is it different today, 18 years later? Yes. Is it better today? No. Is it more appropriate for where we are, how we see the world and where we're going? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it has to evolve. So it's not a one and done. We have to come back and have a cadence around this to make sure that we're continuing to measure and keep this on track and on course. So let me give you an example, um, a, a live example I'm still using today. In, I've worked with a lot of organizations about it. They came out of this. A very, very small yet impactful line item inside of this system, okay? Uh, we were looking at, we wanted to have more engagement with, uh, with our folks who wanted to build up. Um, this is going back many years, but we came up with this thing called two and two. Very simple. And I've implemented it, I don't know how many, countless times. Two and two, the leadership team got together every Tuesday. Leadership team was 10 people. All right, and you do all this leadership stuff, like what's changing, who are we mad at, all that stuff that a leadership team does, all right? But what we implemented was this two and two. Number one, the first two, is that everybody was required to show up knowing two things about the people in the organization. Second thing, everybody was required to show up and report on two experiences that they, re they created inside of that organization in the last week. If we do the math, okay, just on the, just on the execution, if we do the math, that's 10 people, two experiences a week, 50 weeks a year. That's 1,000 intentional experiences aimed at a target every year. And compounding, because as people stay with the organization, another 1,000, another 1,000 that they're witnessing, they're hearing about, they're part of. So here's a live example. Um, I mentioned his name earlier, Alex. He, uh, he knew that he had to show up 
and report on two things that week that he knew about people. And by the way, this can't have anything to do with the caveat. It can't have anything to do with your regular job. This is finding out and getting deeper with the relationship. So he sees Rick, and he walks up to Rick. He's like, Rick, what's going on? Rick says, oh, I'm leaving next week. I'm going to go see my dad. It's his birthday. I'm going out to uh, Arizona. I said, great. And then Rick mentions, he goes, you know, but I'm kind of nervous because I, my driver's license expired, and I, uh, I'm nervous because I need to remember to bring my passport, or I'm not going to get on the plane, and that's not something normally that I bring when I travel, so whatever. So Alex writes that stuff down, and he comes into the meeting that week, and he reports. Rick's going to see his dad for his birthday in Arizona. Great. I heard it. Everybody heard it. Uh, a few weeks later, and, and a lot of the times what we find out, what we know, what we get educated on about our folks turn into those experiences, right? We pull from one side to the other on the two and two. But um, about two weeks go by, and Alex knew he was responsible for doing two things two weeks later. And so he set a reminder in his phone for Saturday at 7 o'clock. And it went off at 7 o'clock, and his reminder was to uh, call Rick and tell him, hey, he left this message for him. Or excuse me, he sent a text to him. He said, enjoy your, uh, tell your dad happy birthday, enjoy your trip, and whatever you do, don't forget your passport. Week goes by, Rick comes back, Rick calls me. I'm like, hey, and granted, I understood where Rick was, so I said, hey, how's your dad? What's going on? Created an experience right there out of this, additional experience. He told me, he said, I, uh, great, it was fine, it was fun, but that's not why I'm calling you. I'm calling you because if I had an organization, I would want to know stuff about people, the leaders inside of it. And I said, of course. So uh, he goes on to tell the story, and he's flabbergasted. He's like, I, John, I don't even remember telling him that. How did he know? Why did he do that? How did he know to remind me to have my passport on Saturday morning? How did he know? And before I could get anything out, an answer out, he interrupted himself, and he goes, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why he know, why he did that, because he cares. And the reality is, Alex cares. Alex cares a whole lot. Alex cares about Rick, okay? But think for a moment, do you think it's possible that absent a system like the two and two, that one little line item in this entire corporation, that little two and two thing, absent that, do you think life could have gotten in the way for Alex? He's got little kids. And what, what, what do little kids do on Saturday morning? It's the only day they get up early, right? Because it's your opportunity to sleep in. And so you think it's possible life could have gotten in the way and that experience would have never happened. Of course, and that's why I'll say this until I'm blue in the face. Having good intentions and being intentional is not the same thing. The people that I help out in the world, the companies I work with, and the leaders, I'm not going to lie, all of them are good people. All of these people have great intentions. They are all very passionate about what they do. But where they lack is that intentional side of having a system in place to deliver on it and execute on it. We can have the best plans in the world, but they all fail in execution. They all fail in execution. So I'm going to close here. I wrote a book about it, if you're interested. I don't know. I had a small bag with me. I've got about 15. I'll trade you a business card for a book if you want. I'll be at the back of the room here in a little bit. Um, if you're sitting there wondering, I don't know if I have an intentional culture or not. I don't know if I'm part of an intentional culture or not. Text intentional to 844-557-5500. And what you'll get back, hopefully very quickly if my staff's doing their stuff, what you get back is a quiz. Not a quiz, quiz, three questions. And if you cannot answer them confidently and swiftly, then I'm going to tell you you don't have an intentional culture. And there's a bonus offer that will come with that too. Okay, let me close down here. I just hit zero. I'm going to steal 20 seconds. So the opportunity, okay, we keep going backwards in this thing. I just read an article not long ago that 25% of organizations out there have a culture plan. Now, based on what we just found out, all right, how is execution, how many of those are unintentional plans? Well, it's probably a fragment, a fragment on execution properly. So the, uh, but the opportunity to differentiate, the opportunity to grow through this, the opportunity to be the choice, the company of choice in your space is massive, is massive. And the opportunity to pick up and inspire the folks that you already have and pick up those extra engagement points is unbelievable. So I'm going to leave you with this, okay? We live too much life at work to be unhappy there. Be intentional every single day about everything, and all will be well. Thanks for hanging out with me. If you want a book, stop at the back here.